This is a follow-up to my last video, which went into detail about Christine and Isabel Maxwell's companies, software companies, that were adopted by U.S. intelligence agencies and all the major social media companies. Well, many of them anyway. Here is the graphic that I left you with at the end. Robert Maxwell, suspected triple agent, and his daughters, Isabel and Christine Maxwell, their sisters to Ghislaine Maxwell, who was partners with Jeffrey Epstein in his sex trafficking operation. And here's a quick look at all the companies and organizations. Not all of them, but a lot of them, the ones that their software is now working with. And I said to you, if Robert Maxwell was a triple agent and Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein were running a blackmail slash compromise organization, what makes us think that Isabel and Christine Maxwell weren't running a similar sort of infiltration operation and compromise operation with their technology? That's where we left off. And now I want to take you down the roads that sort of branched off these different investigations. And some of them are woo-woo and some of them are just straight up business and tech related. The first one, actually, we'll look back at Robert Maxwell's death and an article that was written at that time in the San Francisco Examiner, 1991. It's talking about Maxwell's business empire and its holdings just in the San Francisco Bay Area. One of the ones they mention, one of the companies they mention is Sphere Incorporated, a San Leandro company that sells computer game software under the label Spectrum Holobyte. The Mirror Group, through Maxwell, owned an 80% stake in Sphere Incorporated. Christine and Kevin Maxwell were on the board of Sphere Incorporated. The CEO of that company was Gilman Louie. And what did he do after that? Gilman Louie went on to be the head of the CIA Venture Capital Fund in QTEL. He was the head of the CIA venture capital firm in QTEL. And he had a very direct, close, and intimate relationship with Robert Maxwell, Kevin Maxwell, and Christine Maxwell. In QTEL and the CIA, they worked together because the CIA wanted to develop techno technological tools and it needed someone with expertise. It hired Gilman Louie. I wonder why. I wonder what strings got pulled there. And then Gilman Louis would oversee all kinds of projects, such as, let's look at this. This is from CBS News, by the way. Social media. Social media is a tool of the CIA. Seriously, it says. This is from 2011. You don't need to wear a tinfoil hat to believe the CIA is using Facebook, Twitter, Google, and other social medias to spy on people. They say that the CIA was publishing a helpful list of press releases on all the social media ventures it sponsors via its technology investment arm in QTEL. So that's boom number one. Gilman Louie, 80% owned by the Maxwells and had Christine and Kevin sitting on his board of directors right before he started as head of the CIA's venture capital firm in QTEL. What's next? Isabel Maxwell ran ComTouch, which became Siren, and her software got into all of these things. I was looking up SEC filings about this, and I ran across this one. CrowdStrike Holdings. You might know CrowdStrike because it has a big role in Spygate, in Russiagate, particularly with regards to the DNC hack. So this relates to Seth Rich. This relates to Debbie Wasserman Schultz and possibly the Awan brothers. There's people out there that cover both InQtel and CrowdStrike extensively. I'm not going to get into the background here. I just want to show you the one thing I found. It lists Carrie J. Davis as a director of CrowdStrike. And in that same filing, they describe Carrie J. Davis's qualifications. And they say that he currently serves on the board of directors of Siren. So now we have Siren linked to CrowdStrike. And Isabel Maxwell is co-founder and still involved, as far as I know, with Siren. There's another Maxwell connection right back to the heart 
of Spygate. Here's an article here you could pause and read if you want to know a little bit more about it. All of this will be linked down in the description box as well, like usual, in the reference section. Not all of it, but a lot of things. All right, let's look at Isabel's husbands. The first guy, Carl Jurassi. He's not that interesting by himself. I couldn't find anything interesting. But his dad, Isabel's father-in-law, Carl, sure is. Look how important he is. The Republic of Bulgaria put him on a postage stamp. Why? Because Carl Jurassi is father of the birth control pill. That's right. You know the cultural impact the birth control pill had on the West? There's good documentaries out there about it. Go have a look. This man's invention of the birth control pill is highly significant. Now, there's a Q post that sort of relates to this. January 7th, 2019. They're talking about MK Ultra mind control drugs. And they say program development ongoing under offshore, not domestic, tangent agency with covert funding. Experimented on animals and then humans. Humans in, in 1988. And he goes on to talk about it. Fiction? The hole is deep, he says. Well, when you look at the development of the birth control pill, you find the same exact pattern. It was produced by a company called Syntec. Where? In Mexico City. They talk about having to go down there and groom Mexican scientists to work with them in their lab. And there's a whole big other side story to this, too, that involves some random banker making a huge bet on Syntec as it was going going to go belly up. And then, boom, they invent the birth control pill. Jurassic went on afterwards to become a professor of chemistry at Stanford, and he served as president of Syntex in Palo Alto. You know what other doctor went down to Mexico to learn his skills? Nancy Salzman's husband. He went to Guadalajara, Mexico. I covered that in an earlier video about Nexium. Carl Jurassic was also a member of edge.org. This is John Brockman's foundation where he brings together the brightest minds in the world. He has an annual billionaire's dinner where Google's Larry Page and Sergey Brin go. Uh, Ann Wojcicki from YouTube goes there. Um, Amazon's Jeff Bezos goes there. I could, go on, I could go on for 15 minutes naming the people that go there. Edge.org, go look it up yourself. He's got all kinds of photographs there. Some other luminaries from Edge.org include Marina Abramovic. Jerry Adler from Newsweek, Paul Allen from Microsoft, the list is long. This is a very significant organization worthy of a video on its own, which I probably will do at some point. But we're going to leave Carl Jurassic and we're going to go to Isabel's next husband, David Hayden. There's not really much to say about David Hayden, except that he went on, after they got divorced, to make a competing email system to ComTouch. He was poor for a while, not poor, I'm sure, but he, he didn't make any money for a long time. Then all of a sudden something caught fire and Critical Path got some funding and he lived high off the hog, going so far as to, this is an interesting little bit, together with the television producer Norman Lear, he bought an original copy of the Declaration of Independence and he was invited to the White House. He ended up bankrupt again. That article is talking about how he was currently in the process of selling his furniture. <laughs> We'll leave him there. We'll go to Isabel's next husband, a guy called Al Seckel. Al Seckel is also a member of the edge.org. He was a visual illusionist, apparently. This is him giving a TED Talk in 2007. Al Seckel was interviewed by Jeffrey Epstein in 2010. This is a very long interview, and he goes on and on about his theories about physics and the nature of reality. But this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. In this Daily Beast article from uh, um, August 2019, they say, Isabel followed the family tradition of going bankrupt in 2015 despite having been a multimillionaire. That move may have been related to the untimely demise at age 56 of her third husband, the infamous con man, now they call him, Al Seckel. 
But the interesting part is that in that Daily Beast article, they discuss how they tried to confirm that Al Seckel really died, and they couldn't. This is what it says. A paid obituary was published on Legacy.com, supposedly after appearing in the San Gabriel Valley Tribune, but it does not appear on the paper's website. They talk about how they dug around and they couldn't find any other actual evidence of Seckel having died. And then it occurred to me, okay, this is very handy, isn't it? If you own Legacy.com, you can fake people's deaths all over the place. And for some reason, remember in one of the recent shootings, there was, like, they showed a picture of, I think it was the San Antonio shooter. I'm sorry if I'm getting that wrong. But they showed two different pictures. Like they showed pictures of two different guys. And then when people looked up the one guy, they found an obituary for him from 2014 or something. Do you remember that? And then we went back to look for that obituary and it had been scrubbed. So it raised everybody's suspicions. Like what's really going on here? All right, what's next? In this article from 1999, it talks about Isabel's childhood and all the people her dad knew and the people that might be at her house when she gets home from school. One of them is Professor Murray Jalman, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics, blah, blah, blah. He's an interesting guy. Here he is as a member of edge.org. And it says that he started the Santa Fe Institute. He's a founder of of the Santa Fe Institute from back in 1984. Here we see that Galman also spent several periods at CERN. CERN, the big large hadron collider in Switzerland or Sweden? Switzerland? Can't remember where it is right now. But a lot of people wonder what really goes on at CERN. It's kind of a sketchy, crazy place. And the Santa Fe Institute, look at their symbol. Kind of has a Nazi vibe to me. They give a little description of what it is here. Here's some of the types of projects that they work on. Efforts to create artificial life, chaos theory, genetic algorithms, econophysics, systems biology, evolution of human languages. All this kind of merging of man and machine. It, it's called technocracy. It's called cybernetics as well. So that's what the Santa Fe Institute is. And it's, you know, whatever, you're allowed to look into these things. But the part that's really strange is that they partner with the U.S. Department of Energy on various studies. And you see here that they were interested in mutation genetics and evolution at the U.S. Department of Energy. When I think of Department of Energy, I'm thinking of oil and gas, fracking, dams, hydroelectric power, uh, nuclear energy, that sort of thing. Why are they looking at genetics and human language and chaos theory and synthetic biology? Why are they looking at that kind of thing? Also, here are the authors of that paper. Murray Gell-Mann, Christine Maxwell. There she is again. They're like ghosts. They appear in all of these places. Let's look at a map. Where is the Santa Fe Institute? Here it is up here on the map. And what's 59 minutes away? But the Zorro Ranch, Epstein's Ranch in Santa Fe is 59 minutes away from the Santa Fe Institute. But you know what? That's not the only interesting thing around there. Did you know that the Bronfman family, yes, the Bronfmans, those Bronfmans, have a church in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's called the Uneo de Vegetal. And basically what it did was it got itself a license to import ayahuasca under the guise of being a religion. This is their cult compound, I guess. The actual address is over here with this little shack. But look what's across the road. I, I have a feeling this is the actual... <laughs> Uneo de Vegetal compound here. I might do a video on this separately, so we'll leave it there for now, but this is what it looks like. The Santa Fe Institute is a couple of minutes away by car from the ayahuasca cult. Ayahuasca is like a mind-altering, it's sort of been compared to LSD, but it's a tea that comes from the rainforest. Anyway, it's a couple of minutes away from the Santa Fe Institute, and that's only an hour away from Epstein's ranch. Very interesting. Somewhere right over here is the Los Alamos Labs. 
That's the nuclear testing ground. There's also a tunnel system that crosses the border between Colorado and New Mexico. It's called the Chama San Juan tunnel. People always like to look for these tunnels. It's 26 miles long. Maybe someone out there wants to dig on that because that might lead somewhere too. It's quite close to the Santa Fe Institute, really. Moving on to the next thing. We're going to go to Christine Maxwell now. Remember her with Kiliad? And Kiliad had gotten into the FBI. It also got into Hewlett Packard servers. And then Hewlett Packard supplied the computers and servers to the NSA. And we were talking about in my last video that it was Michael Hayden at the time. The story is he phoned Carly Fiorina at HP and he said, Oh my gosh, we've just had September 11th. Send us some new servers. We need more computing power. And she obliged. But we look back and we see that Kiliad software had already been installed. And then we learn that Carly Fiorina had only been put in as the CEO of Hewlett Packard in 1999. And in 1999, that's when they started using Kiliad software. So then that raises some questions about why Fiorina was chosen to head HP. She was a massive failure as the leader of HP, according to most of the employees there. And the company went downhill after that. She actually got booted out only a couple of years later. And Michael Hayden, Michael Hayden, what became of him? Well, see, he transferred from the NSA over to the CIA. And maybe as a reward, that's why he made Carly Fiorina the first head of the Central Intelligence Agency's External Advisory Board. So I'm going to argue that they wanted Carly Fiorina in there so that they would have a friendly CEO who would agree to put Kiliad software in the servers. And then I look into that and say, is that possible? I see this article from Vicki Ward from 2002, and she says, Fiorina would perhaps not have been considered for the job had it not been for her appearance in 1998 on the cover of Fortune as number one on the list of world's top women in business. Until that moment... There'd only been one story written about her in Investor's Business Daily. Weird. Out of the blue, somebody at Fortune puts Carly Fiorina, a totally unknown quantity, on the cover of Fortune magazine. And then that cover brings Carly Fiorina to the attention of somebody at Hewlett Packard who says, hey, let's nominate her to be CEO. And most of the board, by the way, at HP apparently didn't want her, but she got pushed through anyway. So it's like, if this one important article hadn't have been written, would she even have been in that position? Who was editor at Fortune magazine at the time that decision was made to put Carly Fiorina on the cover? It was a guy called Marshall Loeb. His father is Monroe Harriman Loeb. Do you know these names? These are significant names. Fritz Springmeier wrote a book called Bloodlines of the Illuminati. Both the Harriman and Loeb families feature prominently in this book. And Marshall Loeb's dad is called Monroe Harriman Loeb. Now, because information isn't as freely available as it was even five years ago, I can't be sure that these lobes are connected to the 11 bloodlines of the Illuminati lobes. But look at that name and you tell me what you think. Also, Vicki Ward. Vicki Ward is always writing the stories that surround these people. Vicki Ward is the journalist who brought us the first long-form expose of Jeffrey Epstein back in 2003. And then just recently, she said, remember, I tried to warn you about Jeffrey Epstein back in 2003. But what didn't she write in that article in 2003? She didn't write about the sexual allegations against him at all, even though she admits she had several people coming to her with good evidence, she says. And she wanted to put the stories in. That's that's her story now. That's her story now. She says she tried to warn everybody. It wasn't her fault. She wanted to put the stories in to Vanity Fair, but she didn't because of her editor. 
if it were true that Vicki Ward really was on the side of the little guy at that time, and she believed these women who were coming forward and making these allegations against Jeffrey and Ghislaine, then would we have these pictures today? This is from May 2009. This is Vicki Ward with Ghislaine Maxwell. And in this photo from April 1st, 2008, Vicki Ward hosted a party for La Mer and this is Ghislaine Maxwell at that party. So why is Vicki Ward always getting the scoop on all of these things? You know who else she wrote about, by the way? The DC Madam. Well, actually, hold on, hold on. I misspoke. She didn't write about her. She was in the process of working with the DC Madam when the DC Madam killed herself. Killed herself. And there's, there's way more. Vicki Ward's on the scene all the time. It just raises my eyebrow, that's all. Michael Hayden, by the way, the NSA director who got worked with Carly, Carly Fiorina, he went on afterwards, after he left the government, to work with the Chertoff Group, Michael Chertoff. And also, he is on the board of directors for Caliburn International, a military contractor that oversees operations for Homestead Temporary Shelter for Unaccompanied Children. A military contractor that's Operating shelters for unaccompanied children. Oh, that doesn't sound like it has trouble written all over it, does it? Okay, what have we got? You know what? This has gotten so long already, and I haven't even gotten into Christine Maxwell's husband and her father-in-law and the unbelievable connections there. What we'll start with is we'll look back at this article from 1991 after Robert Maxwell first died and they were reviewing his holdings in the Bay Area. Just for interest's sake, I'll tell you what they are. They mention Research on Demand, Thomas Cook Travel, Jossie Bass, Molecular Design Limited, and Leonardo. That's the one I'm going to look at because that is the baby of Christine Maxwell's husband, Roger Molina. Roger Molina runs Leonardo, published by Pergamon Press, which is the Maxwell Connection, but it's housed in MIT Media Labs. MIT Media Labs is what Aaron Schwartz hacked. Do you remember Aaron Schwartz, a young hacker? He was involved with Reddit somehow, and they threw the book at him. He went into a server closet at MIT. He downloaded a bunch of stuff or something, and they caught him on the videotape, and then they prosecuted him viciously. And the, the joke of it was the stuff that he hacked, allegedly, was with these publications that were, were just sitting on MIT Media Labs' servers, but they weren't, they didn't belong to them in the first place. So everyone wondered why Aaron Schwartz was in so much trouble. The other thing that's ironic about this is is that these guys go around pushing this open information initiative or whatever it is, and they, they say they want information to be free and available to everybody, and yet they threw the book at Aaron Schwartz. So Aaron Schwartz was sentenced to six months in jail, but rather than do this time, allegedly Aaron Schwartz hung himself. That's the story. So there's a big mystery surrounding that. A recent development on the MIT front, Ronan Farrow has come out and written a piece for The New Yorker exposing MIT's deeper ties to Epstein and how they've accepted a lot of funding from him, calling it anonymous so that they can hide their affiliation with Epstein. This story is sort of developing, but I thought I should mention it in this video just briefly. And Roger Molina's publication, Leonardo, was hosted there. It's just something to keep in mind as, as as things develop. Roger Molina, American physicist, astronomer, executive director of Leonardo Publications at MIT Press. He serves on the advisory council of METI, Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence. You can see how these worlds do collide. You have to look at mystical 
metaphysical, Hollywood, magic. You have to look in these areas to see how this all really, really relates to each other. When you really get down to it, this is a huge, huge operation. Here's something Leonardo is into. Here's a conference it's sponsoring. The future of the body in context of neurotechnology. The future of the body in context of neurotechnology. The future of the body. Remember that World Economic Forum Fourth Industrial Revolution video that I said scared me so much? It's exactly what they're talking about. Can we be superhuman? We have to reassess what it means to be human. We have to let go. This is an exact quote. They say we have to let go of the notion of human being a natural concept. They want to merge human and machine. This is not a joke. This is real. And you can see how powerful and embedded the people who think that way are. Above all, that's what I want you to get out of this video, is that the, the tentacles of the people who think this way are in journalism, they're in Wall Street, they're in the medical establishment, they're in foundations, they're in the military, they're in the CIA, FBI, Library of Congress, on the judicial benches, they're everywhere. What else have I got about Leonardo? Right, here's, here's my favorite part of this story. I'll try to briefly sum this up. Frank Molina and the Jet Propulsion Labs that became NASA, basically. He was partners with a guy called Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons went on to be a disciple, more or less, of Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley and the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis. It was this mystery school. Here is a picture of Aleister Crowley in some of his garb. And this uh, Twitterer here, New World Order of the Time broadcast, points out, well, they are all Illuminists from her education, Crowley, Madame Blavatsky students of the mystery school. Following Isis, Horus, and Osiris, Epstein's castle had Horus perched on top next to the Horizon Dome. Yes, look. Look at the similarities. And it links back there. Now, okay, Jack Parsons, Aleister Crowley, and L. Ron Hubbard all knew each other, basically, because Jack Parsons started a temple of the OTO. It was called the Agape Temple in California. And through that... He did this ceremony, I believe with L. Ron Hubbard, called the Babylon Working, where they tried to bring forth a moon child. This is an occult ritual, but this is well documented. This, this happened. And this was all related, don't forget, to NASA. Roger, Molina was, Roger Molina's dad was partners with Frank Molina, who was partners with Jack Parsons, who was into all of this stuff. Frank Molina was suspected of being a communist and the FBI was on his tail and he left the United States and went to France, by the way. That's what happened to him. But this story here, Leonardo's strange angel behind the scenes with Jack Parsons and Frank Molina. The not so well known story of Leonardo's founder, Frank Molina and strange angel Jack Parsons. This story is about what I just told you about Babylon working and the connections to Crowley. But it has an extra piece that I don't know if a lot of people know about. This filmmaker that was going to make this documentary or TV series called Strange Angel, he was doing his research and he went to Paris because one of the characters' mothers is from Paris. And it says, amongst personal correspondence and scientific papers, lay a neatly typewritten story written by Molina and Parsons. It was dated 1937, and scrawled on the front page were the words MGM Project. At that time, Molina was working as an assistant in the Caltech wind tunnel for pennies an hour, while Parsons had a part-time job at an explosives company. Their pitiful salaries provided all the funding for their rocketry research, and they had spent hours scouring scrapyards and rubbish dumps for odds and ends they could use in their experiments. The MGM project was a Hail Mary attempt to garner movie money to finance their scientific dream. The story itself is a garish mix of science fiction and social justice with a dash of occult weirdness thrown in.
Laced with the politics of the day, it tells the tale of a bunch of charismatic young men devoted to designing and building rockets. To call it a Romana clef does not quite do it justice, for while it transparently traces the young rocketeers' scientific struggles and wistful hopes, it also eerily foretells their futures. This is where it gets super, super weird. Pay attention. My mind was blown by this. Set in the Institute, a scientific establishment not unlike Caltech, the story's hero is Franklin Hamilton, a genius physicist and rocket scientist whose black, closely cut, slightly curly hair and good-looking, sharply chiseled face make him a dead ringer for Parsons himself. Thomas Elwood, a union organizer, lover of classical music, and man with social conscience, is the clear doppelganger of Molina. As in real life, the scientists' greatest problem is a lack of financial backing, and their rocket tests often end in explosions, as did those of Molina and Parsons. But while their real-life work was almost universally ignored, in their fictional world, it's being spied upon by powerful, shadowy forces. Part thriller and part socialist manifesto, the story dashes headlong into espionage, murder, and all the intricacies of organized labor. Real life and fictional life diverge when Hamilton and Elwood receive a donation of $100,000 from a wealthy aircraft manufacturer, only to find the manufacturer plans to sell their rocket plans to the Nazis. Well, I don't know if fiction and real life diverge because Jack Parsons did work for Howard Hughes for a while. And Howard Hughes, as you know, ended up a recluse, paranoid, and uh, allegedly it ended up that he hated Jack Parsons. They became mortal enemies. So this part, the donation of $100,000 from a wealthy aircraft manufacturer could be Howard Hughes. During World War II, the the company designed and built several prototype aircrafts at Hughes Airport. These included the famous Hughes H-4 Hercules, and they detail the other things that were built there. Howard Hughes was a wealthy aircraft manufacturer who Jack Parsons worked with. You're telling me they wrote this screenplay in 1937. Supposedly, they wrote this story in 1937. And they foretold exactly what happened in their lives. Well before rockets were even a thing, by the way. Before the Nazis even started with rockets, by the way. Okay, it continues. Parsons and Molina worked on the story every Monday night for at least a year before sending it to NGM. But perhaps unsurprisingly, it's mixed of earnest social realism and the hardcore scientific sp- speculation failed to pique the studio's interest. Nevertheless, the story proved to be a strangely prophetic piece of work. In the story, Elwood is pilloried for his, quote, un-American beliefs, and Molina would be later in his life, causing him to leave the United States and relocate to France after the war. True. Similarly, a character in the story with strong occult interests is killed in an explosion, just as Parsons would be in 1952. Perhaps most surprising of all was the young rocketeer's story foresaw the Nazis' obsession with rockets long before the popular press, or indeed the U.S. government did. Unbelievable. You see what's happening here? What does Q always say? You are watching a movie. You are watching a scripted movie. How far back did this movie start? How could it be that they were working for pennies a day doing unrelated things? Parsons sounds, if you look at his background, he just sounds like a nut. He didn't have education. They're calling him a genius. But really, he just liked to blow things up, basically. How could it be that a guy like that and his friend Frank Molina wrote this whole story of how this whole thing actually would end up going for the next 20 years in 1937. You tell me. You tell me. Were Molina and Parsons actors in a real script? I can think... uh, It's possible. It's all an illusion. What was Aleister Crowley's big thing? Magic. What is magic? 
Magic is con artistry with flair. Magic is changing reality by changing the perceptions of the people around you. Here's a mind blower. Alistair Crowley, who has been accused of being a secret agent, had the same lawyer in England as Robert Maxwell. Isidore Kerman. In this book, it says, For instance, during the trial and for the decade following, Crowley enjoyed the services of prominent West End solicitor Isidore Kerman, a noted bon vivant, real estate speculator, and later advisor to the press baron Robert Maxwell. Advisor or handler? So there's a Crowley-Maxwell connection. One degree of separation. Boom. You see why that blew my mind. I have one more chunk here that I think is fascinating and eye-opening. And it kind of relates in a way to what I've just talked about. Oh, by the way, jet expert killed by blast, mother ends life in grief. This is Jack Parsons when he died, supposedly in a random explosion, you know, because he was always playing with rocket fuel and things like that. He died suddenly. His mom also killed herself. Get rid of the witnesses. Uh, maybe I'm too cynical. Maybe that's it. Okay, this is the last section that I want to talk about today. Closed circuits, a look back at LACMA's first art and technology initiative. Back in the 50s, this organization in Los Angeles said, hey, we've got a great idea. Let's put artists in residence in all of the def big defense contractors and the airlines and the telecommunications companies. Let's do that. And for some reason, a lot of them went along with it. Look at how many people were involved. And this is not even a uh, complete list, by the way. American Standard, Pan Am, Los Angeles Times, RCA, Rand Corporation, Lockheed, Hall, Special Systems, Universal Studios. This looks like a nuclear, ICN, Hewlett Packard, Bank of America, Ford, IBM, GE, and, and all kinds more. All kinds more. 20th Century Fox, Hudson Institute. I don't know what some of those companies even are at this point, but we know they targeted the biggest corporations. Those are like the foundations of the U.S. I don't see any oil companies in there, though, by the way, mind you. A short description of it. This hair-raising idea involved pairing or attempting to pair 67 artists with corporations so that the artists could collaborate with company scientists and engineers. Maurice Tuchman, the first chief curator of modern art that LACMA ever had, instigated the plan soon after leaving his position as a research assistant at New York's Guggenheim Museum when he moved to Los Angeles in 1966. So it was in the 19, sorry, it was 1966. I thought it was in the 50s. One of the artists they had there was a guy called Chamberlain, John Chamberlain, and his art project was a film. And he played this film every day in the cafeteria while the employees of Rand Corporation were eating lunch. It was called The Secret Life of Hernando Cortez. Eventually, the employees couldn't take it anymore, and they forced the company to stop the program. Here is a little, I'm going to play one minute of this for you, if I can stand it that long. Terrible. One wonders what the real purpose of this was. Like, in my opinion, putting artists in there is the, you could be putting spies into all of these organizations. And then they can be doing all this weird stuff and nobody questions them because they're artists and artists are just like that, right? And all of these corporations and more participated. In this little blurb about it, it says the original AT&T program presented an opportunity to incorporate new procedures and materials into their work. The participating companies such as Kaiser Steel, IBM, Hewlett-Packard, Rand, Lockheed, 
had more pragmatic motives for participating. Some wanted good press or to promote a certain project, while others were socially connected with Marilyn Chandler, the wife of powerful Los Angeles Times producer, uh, publisher Otis Chandler, and a major booster of the program. Chandler. Chandler. We don't know who this Rachel Chandler person is. She's being pictured on a jet with Bill Clinton, and she's associated with some speculation that she might be involved in a child procurement operation like Ghislaine Maxwell is. Nobody knows where Rachel Chandler comes from, but she comes from money because she married Tom Guinness, the heir to the Guinness fortune, right? Chandler, she's from California. There's speculation that these people, Mrs. Otis Chandler, it's speculated that Rachel Chandler is related to them. And if they were the ones involved in this getting artists into major corporations initiative, then you can see that the connections there, you can see how it's a similar theme again. And listen to this little blurb. From the time Mrs. Otis Chandler, the philanthropist whose husband owned the Los Angeles Times, provided the initial financial backing in 1967 to when the original art and technology exhibition opened at the museum in 1971, the Chicago Democratic National Convention riots, the My Lai Massacre, the Kent State shootings, and the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy had all happened. That was an insane period of political and social unrest, violence. And that's, that's during the time period of that project. Now consider this. LACMA announced a revival of the art and technology program in December 2013. So they're doing it again. They started in 2014. Has politics gotten more or less stable since that? I don't like they're doing it again. Why are they doing this again? It reminds me of these Q posts, especially the part about the screenplay that Frank Molina and Jack Parsons wrote in 1937. Q posts, people kill people, you are watching a movie. They want you weak, slave, sheep, distraction. January 4th, Q 2018, Q posts, what makes a movie good? Great actors? June 11th, 2018, Q posts in reference to pictures he posted in the previous drop, but the last line is, you are watching a scripted movie. What does he mean by that? How big is this movie? How long is this movie? When do we get to see the final credits roll? Because I'd like to get back to some sanity. I know everybody else would too. <laughs> well, I've got to stop. I've got to stop talking now. If you liked this whirlwind tour of some of the tentacles that relate to Isabel and Christine Maxwell's involvement in the tech industry, their husbands, in Qtel and Gilman Louie, uh, the crowd strike implications, the weird movie that was written 10 years at least before the rocket program began that foretold the whole lives of Frank Molina and Jack Parsons, Alistair Crowley connections. If you liked this video, please leave me a thumbs up. Please leave me a comment, share, subscribe if you have not subscribed. I would love some more subscribers. Also, if you want to help me keep doing this work, you can send me a little support through my PayPal link, which I'll leave in the references below. And I'll also make a comment with the, with the address there. I have a website now. It's amazingpoly.net. I'm hoping to add some writing to that as soon as I can. I'm over on BitChute. I'm at Twitter. Until next time, everybody, peace out.